All right. Hey, make some noise if you're excited to be at church today. Come on. It's a good statistic. About 75% of you are excited. The rest of you got dragged here. It's all good. Glad you're here with us. We're in part six. This is the final installment of our legacy series. You can catch it all up online, you guys, and you should because, man, this has been a, a very passionate series for me. I don't know if it's the stage of life that I'm in. I got my oldest is going to be graduating high school, so I'm thinking differently about life and about legacy. So it's hitting a little bit differently for me as much as it is for you. I was told a couple weeks ago after I preached that, that gap message, someone said, Pastor, you hurt me. I mean, I hurt you because I love you. No, I'm just kidding. That's what I tell my kids. I hurts because I love you. So, hey, man, I'm excited that you're here. We also have an online audience, and not only like in Bakersfield and around Bakersfield, but our Teen Challenge Men's Ranch and Women's Center. Can we give it up for everyone who's online in our Teen Challenge? So excited you guys are with us. They catch us every week here in the Kern County Teen Challenge Centers. Man, excited that we're able to... You guys are family. You guys may not be here in the building, but you are family with us, and we love you and excited about what God's doing in your life. In part six, you guys, we're going to study Nehemiah chapter six, chapter six of Nehemiah. Um, let me catch you up on this series, though, because uh, we've, we've kind of gone this journey. For those of you that don't know, Nehemiah, the beginning of this book begins with this guy, Nehemiah, who is like second in command in Babylon. The, the Israelites, the Jewish nation, they're in exile because they started disobeying the word of God and practicing kind of foreign worship and, and the, the culture of the world just kind of infiltrated them, which that's what the kind of Matthew Dudley last week, how many of you liked last week's Matthew Dudley message, yeah? Yeah, he said if, if, if you want to live for God, then you can't, you can't follow the kingdom, the culture of the world, but the kingdom of God. And so this is what happened, that's why we had him come and speak that very relevant message in our in our time of, of society and culture, because that's why the Jewish nation was in, was in exile, because they let the culture influence them instead of letting, letting God and his world, word influence their lives. So here Nehemiah is, though, second in command, and he leaves it all. Like, he leaves his, his career, his livelihood, to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And, and the reason why is because Nehemiah was getting to a place in his life where he knew like what he wanted to leave was just not a nest egg for his family. He wasn't considered about leaving a nest egg. He was considered about leaving a godly legacy. Amen, somebody? I think, like, like, that's what we should be more concerned about, you guys. We should be more concerned about not just giving our kids and handing off, like, to our, our children the car and the house and, like, some sort of benefits. We should be concerned and more concerned about, about handing off faith to our kids, a godly legacy, handing off spiritual maturity and wisdom. Those are the things that are going to last forever. And here Nehemiah is. He leaves all the comfort of a palace life to go back to this broken, desperate situation in Jerusalem because he knew, I could be used by God. I could make a difference. And we're in this rebuilding season, I believe. We're studying Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the walls, because I believe as a, as a society, <laughs> we're in a rebuilding season. I think that many of us in this room, if we're honest, we have some work to do. There's, there's a rebuilding that needs to happen in our marriage and in our life, in our homes, in our commitments, in our faith. There's just so much kind of damage and destruction. The walls have been broken. The enemy has come in over the last year and a half, two years of this crazy world that we live in now of COVID and quarantines and, and culture and all the stuff that we've been exposed to and endured has chipped away at some of those commitments and principles. And we are in a rebuilding season. It's why we're studying the book of Nehemiah. But here we are at the at the end of rebuilding the wall in Nehemiah chapter 6. And we're going to study some things. Is it okay? We How many of you love the word of God? Amen? You love the word? We're going to study Nehemiah 6 mostly today. Let me go to the end, kind of the end of this chapter and just show you. This is, this is kind of the end. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. Okay. So <laughs> Nehemiah did in 52 days. What they said could not be done, like would never be done. In fact, they had 80 years of trying to do this and failed. But here Nehemiah comes on the scene and he does it in 52 days. Like what's the secret? What's the secret to like to finishing well and finishing strong? And you know what the secret is? I'll tell it to you. Don't quit. Don't, the title of today's message is called Keep Building. 
So, so in here, and we're going to back up in Nehemiah chapter 6 because all the walls are like practically complete. They just need to put the doors and the gates and some finishing touches. But how many of you know at the end of the goal is the hardest? The closest you get to that finish line, the harder it is with every step. It's like the last six pounds are the hardest. Yeah, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You're like, I look good enough. I'm fine. You know what I mean? And or, or some of you seniors in high school, my daughter's a senior in high school, when you're like, maybe you're going to get your BA or your degree or you're going to graduate from high school, it's that last year, right? You're like, my daughter's got this cake schedule. And she's like, oh my gosh, I can't stand being here. Yeah, it's because you're at the end. of the, It's not that it's harder. It's that mentally you're just checked out. We're somewhere else. And sometimes, how many people have you seen? They lived a good life. They were faithful. They followed God. But somewhere like along the line, as they get closer to the finish line, they stop practicing the principles that got them there. And they got tripped up and faltered along the way. How many people have we seen in their 40s, 50s, or 60s, they just put it in neutral and started coasting and, and stopped living the faithful, committed, rebuilding, godly legacy life that got them there in the first place. And now you're, in, you're coasting. And, and I think about... I think about like King Solomon, who, who was handed the kingdom from David, set up. We studied this some while back when we studied King David. He was set up, man, and, and, and he started really well. He built the temple, right? He, he, built, he, so he kind of surpassed David and built an even greater kingdom of the in, entire world. But, but as he got closer to his finish line, we see Solomon start to put it in neutral. Solomon begins to adopt some of those practices of pagan worship. He starts to take all these concubines and thousands of concubines, and he starts to erect pagan statues all over Israel, all over. And, and here he was, started so well, but not finishing well. Started so good. Some of you started so good in your marriage. You started so good in your walk with God. You started rebuilding so well, but somewhere along the line, you put it in neutral. You, you just, you stopped working on the wall. And I'm here to tell you today to keep building. Don't quit. Keep building. Let's back up in Nehemiah chapter 6. We want to study this thing because th there has been major opposition all throughout the rebuilding of the wall. Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem, they've tried a lot. They've tried to like discourage the people, right? They tried to like divide them and cause discord. But now at the end of the project, they're getting desperate. Nehemiah chapter 6, it's the end of the project. They're getting ready to finish and they get real desperate. Look what it says in Nehemiah chapter 6. Let's start at verse 1. When word came to Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in. Someone say close the gaps. Come on, call back to part four. You ought to go watch it. Though up to that time I had not set in the doors and the gates, Sambalot and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But here's what he says. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and I'm not quitting for you. Okay. Why should I? He says, why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times, so over and over and over, they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. There are now, at the end of this project, at the end of the goal, when you're rebuilding for God and you're trying to leave a godly legacy, especially when you get towards the finish line, like you got the goal in sight, we're going to see in Nehemiah chapter 6, there are three tricks of the enemy that will always be employed when you get closer to that finish line. He wants to prevent you from rebuilding and leaving a legacy. And there's three tricks that you just need to, you just need to know. Okay, it's coming at you. And honestly, as, as I even talk about these, some of you can identify why you are even in the rebuilding stage you are in today because you got tripped up by one of these tricks. It's why we're rebuilding, because one of these tactics were employed against us, and now we got to rebuild, okay? So say again, keep building. Okay, let's do this. There's three, three tactics. We're going to keep building in spite of them. In spite of the tactics of the enemy, we're going to keep building. Number one, we got to keep building in spite of distractions. Okay, that's why some of us are rebuilding today, because we got distracted from what God called us to do. 
You started well, but you got distracted, and you started going in a different direction. And we live in a world of distractions, don't we? We do. I hear the phones going off right now. Somebody need to silence that thing. It's a distraction in Jesus' name. We live in a world of distractions. I didn't even, that just happened. You know, the, the studies show that, that we pick up our phones 58 times a day. 58 times a day we pick up our phones. The average American spends three hours and 45 minutes a day on their phone. Here, can I tell you something? The devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. As long as you're distracted, like he's not, he's not bothered with you, man. As long as you're, he doesn't need to worry about destroying you. All he needs to do is distract you. Have you ever noticed your day seems to vaporize and you wonder like what happened to all of your best intentions, all the things that you plan to do? It's like your work day is over and you're like the to-do, you didn't even put a dent in the to-do list. So you go home and you're justifying doing another hour of work at home because you didn't manage your time well at work. Or you say, I'm going to wake up at some ungodly hour because you, you know, just to, just to, and it's, it's because we allow these distractions, okay? And I'm telling you, it's, not only is that unsustainable, but it's very mysterious how we never accomplish what we want to accomplish, isn't it? Because we wake up the next day and we're like, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it this time, and it don't happen. Again and again and, and again. <laughs> so the New York Times, check this out. The New York Times published this, this study that was done on workers and how they, you know, how much they get distracted at work. Workers get interrupted as often as every 11 minutes during the workday. Every 11 minutes, we're interrupted. We're interrupted, but check this out. It takes 25 minutes to refocus after each interruption. Some of you are doing the math right now, and it don't add up, does it? That's the reason why we're finding it impossible to get anything done is because we, are, we don't have the, amount, the time to refocus. So because of the distraction, you're never focused enough to gain traction. Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 2. Nehemiah said, no, I'm not going to get distracted by this. The time for meeting and conversation is over. It's time for action. I'm in rebuilding season. This is just a scheme of the enemy to get me off the wall. And this will always happen when you're fulfilling your purpose. When you're rebuilding your life. Sometimes, listen to me, sometimes... Fighting the enemy is a distraction to your destiny. Because you can either choose to spend your time fighting your enemies or building the wall. And some of you are get, you're, you're getting baited into every argument. That's why you will never build a legacy. Okay, okay, okay. You give into the distraction and it's messing up with your traction. See, there's a season for everything. Sure, there's a time to... For war, there's a time to peace. peace. There's a time to build up and there's a time to tear down. The reason why Nehemiah was able to finish in record time, the reason why he finished well is because he refused to be distracted by anything. He kept his eyes on the goal. He, they came at him four times and every time was the same answer. If you want to leave a legacy, you got to keep building in spite of distraction. Number two, you got to keep building against the second tactic. Keep building in spite of the defamation. Okay, this is another tactic of the enemy as you get towards your finish line. Here's what they, they tried to slander him. They tried to discredit Nehemiah. You know what I've learned? If you're going to do great things for God, you're not only going to attract the attack of the enemy, but you're going to attract the criticism of people. See, those who dream big will be criticized by people who live small. Always, always. Okay, so you're going to build a godly legacy. You're going to build something great for God's kingdom. Not only are you going to get spiritual attack, but just be aware. You're going to get criticism from other people. That's what happened to Nehemiah. Let's pick it up. Verse 5. Then the fifth time Sambalot sent his aid to me with the same message. And his hand, in his hand, was a sealed letter, like a letter to the editor. You know what I mean? It was meant to like discredit. In which it was written. Here's what the letter said. It's report and this is a lie. This is just slander. This is just they're trying to slander Nehemiah. It was reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it's true. See, I got a witness here with me. I mean, you can fill a room with my haters. Don't make them true. Oh, there, but there's two witnesses. I don't care. Got two liars. <laughs> 
but, a, but against a testimony of two witnesses. <laughs> haters going to hate. Come on, somebody. <laughs> haters going to hate, hate, hate. Okay. So I got this, yeah, I got this witness too. He says it's true that, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore you're building the wall. That wasn't what happened. Moreover, according to these reports, these falsified fake reports, you're about to become their king and even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. Here's what they're going to say. There is a king now in Judah. Now this report, they're saying, oh, hey, this report's going to get back to the real king, Artaxerxes. So come, let's talk about this. Stop building, stop rebuilding, because there's this report. Why don't you stop rebuilding so we can talk about this thing? They tried to slander Nehemiah. You're trying to just build your own empire. You're trying to just do your own thing. You're trying to set yourself up. Anybody who sets big goals is going to be criticized and slandered by people who set no goals. You want to do big things? You know why? Failures hate success. Can I say that again? Like failures hate success. They, they, because of their own insecurities and your success, it causes them to do some slanderous things, doesn't it? It causes them to try to get in the way of your success. But who is the most falsely accused man in history? Jesus was the most falsely accused man in history. Write this down. It's not in your notes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Let me read it to you. Jesus said this. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Did you catch that? Okay. Jesus said, look, it's going to happen when you're living for me and you're building a godly legacy and you're advancing my kingdom. You're going to get people that revile you and persecute you and falsify information about you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. See, first they tried to sidetrack Nehemiah, and then they tried to slander Nehemiah. You know, the, the Greek word for Satan is diabolos. Do you know what literally diabolos translates to, to? Slanderer. See, when you slander your brother, your sister, when you slander somebody, listen to me, you are acting in the spirit of diabolos. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. When you accuse, your, when because of your own insecurity, your small thinking and small living, you start accusing somebody for doing great things for God, you are sitting in the seat of Satan. Slap somebody. No, I'm just kidding. Don't slap anybody. You just receive that. Nehemiah discerns their motives in verse 9. So he discerns, he, sends, he sent them this reply. Nothing like what you're saying is even happening you're just making it up in your head nehemiah goes i know what you're trying to do no no no. you're trying to get me off of this wall to get me to stop working to start defending myself have you ever had to stop working and stop rebuilding and stop doing what god has called you to do to stop just to defend yourself against what someone was saying Nehemiah said, no, 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 I'm not going to get, no, I'm building something great. I'm not going to get distracted by the slam. I'm not going to run down every rumor and every innuendo. That's a side note. That's an attack of the enemy. I'm going to keep building in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, probably the most difficult thing to do if you're going to build something great and leave a legacy is handle false accusation. Because if you are going to build something great and leave a legacy then you, you will get falsely accused. People will question your motives for doing something great just like they did Nehemiah. Who are you? Who do you think you are? You think you can do something great for God? Who are you? I know who you are. You're just trying to do it and they'll make up all kinds of motives about you. They, they do it with me in Discovery Church. It's just, we're sitting blessing of God and it's growing and they're going... Yeah, who's that church? You know, all they care about are numbers over there, that church. And that's all they care about is seeing people in the doors. You know why they're doing that? Because failures hate success. All right? I'm not going to get off the wall, though. I'm going to keep building in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. They were trying to frighten us, he says, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But here's what he did. He didn't get distracted. He prayed. Here Nehemiah is again. I prayed, now, Lord, strengthen my hands. When you're being accused and you're slandered 
And there's defamation, this attack of the enemy. It's emotionally draining. I don't know if you've ever been slandered or you've ever been backstabbed and seen someone gossip or falsify stuff and say you're wrong. It's emotionally draining in and of itself. But then if you get off your wall and chase it down and try to just defend yourself, how draining that is on your time and your energy. But if you're going to leave a legacy, you got to realize that the first thing that the enemy wants to do is distract you. Once you start getting to, once you start going, you're doing good, you're doing good, but then he's going to try to distract you. Then, if he can't distract you, he's going to try to discredit you. He's going to try to, to, to bring some defamation to your character, say things against you. And you can spend your time fighting criticism or keep working on the wall, okay? Here's the third thing. If you want to leave a legacy, you got to keep building in spite of danger. In spite of danger. And that's a dangerous thing living for Jesus. It's a dangerous thing to build something great for God's kingdom. It's not easy. Again, I've told you, if it was easy, everybody would do it. There is danger in living for God and building something great and putting myself out on the front lines and leading my family in godliness and righteousness and holiness. There's, you know what? This is dangerous to be out in the front. First, they tried to sidetrack him. Then they tried to slander him. Now they're going to try to scare him. They're going to try to scare him. Look at verse 10. One day, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut in in his home. COVID. No, I'm just kidding. He said, <laughs> he said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple. Look what he's, now this is what he's saying. Shemaiah is telling him, hey, let's go meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you by night. They're coming to kill you. Time out real quick. I need to tell you about Shemaiah. Shemaiah is a sellout. <laughs> Shemaiah's a punk, you know what I mean? I'm going to just say it right now, okay? Look, listen, Shemaiah was the friend of Nehemiah, a priest of God, and, and evident, he was bought out by Sambalot to come and, and infiltrate the friendship and the loyalty and the place and the honor of his po position with God to come and get Nehemiah's ear to tell him a lie that his life was in danger to get him from stop rebuilding and run and hide. Safeguard. Oh, they're coming. They're, they're coming. I'm telling you, the enemy will, will infiltrate your ranks. You better be careful. Look what he says. But I said, should a man like me run away? Oh, come on, somebody. Nehemiah, is, he said, look, I'm going to, here's what he's saying. I, I know what the implication is from me running from this fight, running from this wall. I know who I'm leading. I'm the leader. I'm the father of my house. I'm the leader of this team. I'm the leader of this ministry. I'm the leader of this organization. I started, the, should a man like me run away? Because the implication is now for my kids and my legacy. Should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his own life? He said, I will not go. I realize, look what he says, I realize that God had not sent him. Nehemiah was very perceptive. Here's a priest, a friend, giving him a word. Have you ever got a word from somebody? You know what I mean? Someone tried to give you a word. Well, I, gotta, I know what you should do. Here's it. And they're just so way off, you know what I mean? Sometimes, they're not here either hearing from God. Sometimes they, they are trying. To make you fail. Sometimes they want you to fail. Sometimes because of their own brokenness, they want to see you broken. Because of their own failures, they want to see you fail. Sometimes it's a tool of the enemy. And Nehemiah had this perception to be able to realize, no, no, this is, you know why he was able to realize it wasn't from God? Because he knew what, number one, he knew what God's voice sounded like. And number two, he knew what God called him to do. This was a contradiction and confliction to what God called me to do. No, I don't receive that. No, no, no. I realized that this, that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalot, they hired my buddy. They hired my friend, the priest, to get me to stop rebuilding. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. So here's the reality. Here's why it was such a big deal to get him to do this. Because if, for him to go run to the temple, into the Holy of Holies, and lock himself in where they could not come in would be for him to commit a sin. Numbers chapter, I think it's 18, says it, it has the law that only the priest can go into the Holy of Holies. 
And there was a penalty for anyone who stepped into the Holy of Holies without the proper authority. And it was the death penalty. So you got to be careful. Here's, here's what the enemy will do. If he can't get you distracted, and he can't, he can't, he can't get you to, to give in and quit because of the slander, he'll try to get you to sin to discredit your character. Be careful you don't compromise your convictions and discredit your character. This is the attempt here to get him to, to run into the Holy of Holies to discredit him. Nehemiah kept building. He didn't let these tactics of the enemy stop him from doing what God has called him to do. Verse 16, not in your notes, but up here. It says, when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. So up to this point, uh, for six chapters, you guys, it's the Jewish people who were scared, who were discouraged, who were the ones kind of, kind of on the defensive. And now when the wall is built and Jerusalem is now a fortified nation, now the tables are turned. Now they know, oh my goodness, God is with these people. Here's what I want to do today. I want to help apply this to your life. Because all the points that I just shared with you today have something in common. They are personal attacks toward the leader. See, up to this point, to, this, to, to where they were almost at the goal, almost at the finish line, Every attack of the enemy was towards the people. Get them discouraged. Get them to stop building. Cause division amongst their ranks. But towards the end now, as this last ditch effort, the enemy starts to directly attack the leader. You know why? Everything rises and falls on leadership. There's, there's no organization, ministry, church, no family, no school, no business can go further than the leadership is able to lead it. The quickest way to stop a movement is to knock off the leader. The quickest way to rob your children of their calling and their destiny is to knock you off of yours, father, mother. The quickest way to do that is to go after the head. Jesus actually talks about this. When the shepherd is removed, he says the flock scatter. It's true today, even of, the, of churches. When Satan wants to cripple a church, who does he go after? goes after the pastor. That's why I ask for your prayers. We're going next week, you guys. Next week, I'm taking all of our pastors and our staff on our annual retreat to go do some vision planning and strategy. And can I ask you to spend some extra time in prayer for us? We do it every year. We get away. We go to some isolated place and seek the face and the heart of God for his vision and direction. And, and I want to ask for your prayers because when the enemy wants to take an attack at us, he's going for, he's going for me. He's going for my marriage. He's going for my family. But not only the pastor, he's going to go after church leadership. Like all, all leadership is what he's going to, he's going to go after. Um, I need you to realize that if you're going to build something for God, some people aren't going to like you. And, and they're going to attack you. Some people are going to want you to fail. Now listen, how you handle those attacks, those personal attacks, determines what kind of leader you're going to be and what kind of legacy you're going to leave. One of the biggest lessons of Nehemiah is that leadership is essential for legacy. You will never leave a legacy if you don't know how to lead. If you don't know how to lead your family, lead your team, lead that business, if you don't know how to lead like God wants you to lead, you'll never leave a legacy. With the right leadership, they were able, listen, to accomplish in 52 days what they couldn't accomplish in 80 years, what they said was impossible. What kind of person does it take to accomplish the impossible? I want to close out the message today with answering that question. What kind of person does it take to leave a legacy, a legacy man or a legacy woman? Let's look at the characteristics of Nehemiah together. Here it is. Number one, if you want to leave a legacy, it takes a compelling purpose. A compelling purpose. That's the very first element, man. You need a vision for your life. You need a dream. You need a cause. You need a goal. You need a purpose. You know, that it's something that doesn't drive you, it draws you. Do you know the difference? You know, you're, some, of your, some of you husbands, your wife has to drive you to do the dishes or to pick up the, or to clean the yard. I don't know. Come on now. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about some, a compelling purpose that actually draws you. You have to have a compelling purpose if you want to leave a legacy. Verse 4, again, Nehemiah 6, it says this. So I sent messengers to them in this reply. I'm carrying on a what? A great, do you have a great project? Is there a great project, an overall compelling purpose? What motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? 
What, what motivates you to continue to live your life faithful to the God who created you? What motivates you towards faithfulness and godliness in the pursuit of, of building for him? What is your motivation to keep going? See, until you have a compelling purpose, you're not living. You're just existing. You need a compelling purpose for your life. Nehemiah said, I got a great project. Let me ask it like this. What are you exchanging for your life? Jesus said, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? What are you exchanging? A lot of people think the most valuable thing is your money. Oh, what am I giving my money to? You can always get more money. You can never get more time. Your time is your life. What are you exchanging your life for, your time for? Do you have a compelling purpose that you're giving your life and your time to? That's the mark of a legacy person, a, a compelling purpose. See, great lives are produced by a commitment to a great cause. Look, to leave a legacy and to build something great, it doesn't take a great person. It doesn't take an extraordinary person. It's a regular, normal person that has a great commitment to a great cause, a compelling purpose. That's what it is. And I'll submit to you today that the most compelling purpose that you can have for your life is building God's kingdom. That's the most compelling purpose purpose, building something that will last for eternity, not just something here on this earth, but building something that's going to last forever. If you want to leave a legacy, it's going to take a compelling purpose. Number two, it's going to take a clear perspective, a clear, you got to see through the clutter, to see through the distractions and the, the cloud. Nehemiah had this incredible discernment. He had a spiritual radar. He was able to sniff out, right, it, it, the, just the, the deception and the schemes and the traps. He could smell it. In verse 2, he saw it coming. He said, now this is a scheme to harm me. He was perceptive. He had discernment in verse 9 when they're making accusations against him and questioning his motives. He's all, nope, I'm not going to stop. That's another attempt to distract me. In verse 12, when, when you know, Shemaiah the sellout tried to get him to run, he knew, again, acute perception. He had an ability to anticipate the trap. He had this, where do you get this kind of perception? Where do you get this wisdom to leave a legacy? Come on back to James with me. James chapter 1, verse 5. If a man lacks wisdom, where do you get it? You get it from God. That's what the Bible says. When you spend time in God's word, listen to me, you get the mind of Christ. You, you need wisdom and perspective to be a legacy person. You won't fall for everything if you had wisdom. You won't get distracted by everything, baited into everything if you had a little bit of perspective and wisdom. You know what, you know the biggest thing that clouds people's perception? Like that I've seen, like clouds perspective most in most people's lives. The biggest thing is fear. Fear tends to cloud our perspective. And we make more decisions out of the reaction of fear than I think we even realize. Make reactionary decisions. You know what fear is? Here, let me give you a definition of fear. Fear is false evidence appearing real. That's what fear is. And that's what they tried to do to Nehemiah. They falsified evidence. Here's, here's, here's what the king thinks. Here's what everyone else thinks. Here's what's really out. No, no, that's, that is not, that's, I'm not going to allow my fear to dictate my decision. If you want to leave a legacy, then you need to have a clear perspective. Number three, you need to have a continual prayer. A continual prayer. Nehemiah was a prayer addict, man. Prayer, he prayed he prayed first before he went into all the, all the obstacles, the challenges, the difficulties, the forks in the road. He didn't go get advice first. He didn't go talk to his buddies first. He didn't, uh, you know, he didn't do a pros and cons list first. The first thing he did was pray. And if you want to leave a legacy, you need to learn how to pray first. Here's how we like to say it. You need to make prayer your first response instead of your last resort. How many times would you have made just a better decision if you got God's mind about it? If you just opened up your life to God's wisdom and perspective, you need a continual prayer. See, Nehemiah didn't get defensive. He didn't, he didn't get defensive. He didn't retaliate. In verse 9, remember, he said, I prayed, and I received strength from God. That's what I did. I'm going to pray about it. He said, it's not true, and he went to God in prayer. He didn't answer it. He didn't try to get involved in a debate. He prayed. Luke chapter 18 says this. That Jesus taught the followers that they should always pray and never lose hope. You know what I found is that those two are connected. Meaning this, you're either going to have one or the other. You, if you don't pray, you're going to lose hope. If you're losing hope today, you know why? You ain't praying. You can, you can either pray or panic. 
under pressure and when there's this danger and defamation and distractions, you can either panic or you can pray. And if you want to rebuild something or build something great for God and leave a legacy, then you need to have a continual prayer. Number four. How many of you getting something out of this, you guys? Come on. Number four. You need a courageous persistence. Some of you need to get some thicker skin, man. Quit quitting at the first sign of danger, the first sign of slander, at the first sign of opposition. You're ready to give up on your marriage again. You're ready to give up on God. Give up on another church. Give up on another job. Give up on another relationship. If you want to leave a legacy and build something great, you need to get some courage. A courageous persistence is what we need. One of the great keys to success is this ability to hang in there. Like it's despite the danger, despite the attack, to keep on keeping on. No matter what they're saying, no matter what they're doing. Verse 4, it says four times. Remember, four times they kept coming at me with the same thing and I gave them the same answer. You need some courage. What is courage? Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is moving ahead in spite of your fear. That's what courage is. Look, it, just because you have fear doesn't mean you don't have courage, right? Some of you think that you have this fear, you have that anxiety, you have these what ifs and that thoughts, that that makes you lack courage. No, no. It, if you don't have fear, then you can't be courageous. Courage is moving forward in spite of the fear. Like if you're not afraid, you're not courageous. You may just be dumb. You may not know what kind of the danger that you're in and the reality of the situation that the enemy is trying to attack, that your kid's life is in the balance, that your marriage is under attack. You may just be an ignorant husband, ignorant parent, if you ain't got a little bit of fear in you. You better, be, you better have a little bit of fear in you, but move forward in spite of your fear. You don't move and make your decisions and reactions come fear. You need a courageous persistence in spite of fear. I love what Nehemiah said. He said, should a man like me run away? Should a man like me run away? He says, I'm not going to run away. I, I'm, I'm a little bit scared. <laughs> I mean, they're threatening my life. They're threatening to, to kill me. But, but what I am building is worth it. What I'm building is worth it. It's worth my life. It's worth the risk. It's worth the danger. I'm going I'm to move forward in spite of the fear, in spite of me, my anxiety, in spite of the pressure. You know how you know you're afraid? One of the big telltale signs, to, like when you know you're afraid is this, when you have an insatiable desire to run away. Whenever you want to run away, and some of you, you will, you will add faith to it. Oh, no, God's just calling me to move on. <laughs> just call me, to another, call me to another job. Yeah, right, you just couldn't handle the pressure. Call me to another church. Call me to another team. Call me to another ministry. Call me to another marriage. Call me, and you, what you're doing is, is, it's that desire to run. That's, that's how you know that fear is pulling the strings. You know what I've, I've discovered? It is never God's will for me to run from a difficult situation. Never. Some of you are letting that difficult situation and that pressure dictate and, you, and you're like faith in and Jesus juking all over the place. It is never God's will for you to run from a difficult situation. Learn from it, yes. Grow from it, yes. Build my faith and my character from it, yes. Become better from it, yes. But run from it, no. I'm not saying that you might not, that God may not move you around. And there are some times where God will move you around. But it's not to run from the difficulty. It's it's never to run from the difficulty. He wants you to grow in the fire, to grow in the difficulty, for your character and your faith to grow. Galatians 6 verse 9 says it like this. Let us not be weary in building. Come on. Let us not be weary in working on our marriage, baby. Let us not be weary on building this wall. Let us not be weary on leaving a godly legacy. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. If this one thing, here it is, this only prerequisite, if we just don't give up along the way, honey. If we just keep building, if we just keep working, if we just don't quit, man, we're going to reap a harvest if we do not give up. Here's the last one, number five. And this is an important one. It takes a commitment to God's principles. A commitment to God's principles. Let me, let me tell you, the enemy doesn't care if you leave a good legacy. He cares if you leave a godly legacy. The enemy does not care if you have a good marriage. 
He cares if you have a godly marriage. Are you hearing me, you guys? In your rebuilding, make sure you come back in alignment to the principles of God. Don't settle for good when God created you for great. Don't settle for good. You need to get back to the godly principle. It's the reason why the Jewish nation was in exile. is because they abandoned the principles of the word of God that govern their life, that govern their relationship, that govern their business, that govern their finances, that govern every part of their life, the principles of God that they were abandoned. Listen to me. If you want to leave a legacy, a godly legacy, then you need to make a commitment to God's principles. Here's why I think this is so important. I think that in our culture today, and, and maybe if I could speak to maybe the Christian culture, some of you may not get this, others of you can. I think we're so experientially rich and biblically poor, and that's why you're falling all the time. That's why so many people fall when the pressure comes and when danger comes and slander comes and difficulty comes and distraction comes. And, and the reason why you continue to have rebuilding seasons in your life, going around same mountains and same problems is because you chase worship nights instead of the word of God. We, uh, we're going to be gone this next week, so we're not going to have a night of worship, by the way, which, uh, which sucks. I mean, I love having those nights of worship, but we're going to be in a mountain and, and seeking the face of God. And, um, and I'd encourage you, you know, some of you, you know, you probably go find another night of worship. <laughs> I'd encourage you to get into your word. Get into your word. You need a commitment to God's principles. Nehemiah chapter 8. I got I to gotta hurry. Nehemiah chapter 8. Now this is a few chapters later. What's really cool uh, about this whole, they, they rebuilt and they did the work and stuff. And then Ezra's name is, he's mentioned first in Nehemiah chapter 8. I told you guys, Ezra, the book before Nehemiah, he was the priest that came to rebuild the temple before Nehemiah. Years before Nehemiah came to rebuild the walls, Ezra came with some exiled Jews to rebuild the temple. And here he is, he shows up, and this is what happens. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. It says this, that he read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and, and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Now, aren't you grateful for teaching where it's just not reading you the Bible, but making it clear so you understood what's being said? So every time that the Jewish nation kind of diverted from God and they were coming back and it happened actually several times throughout the Old Testament before God just said y'all going into exile now every time when they would come back to God a priest would dust off the scriptures and they'd open up the scriptures again and they'd read and, and it was shocking to the people because they were they lived for a generation not knowing the command the will and the principles of God and, and something has to happen if you're going to leave a legacy, if you're, going to, if you're going to stay under the covering of God, the favor, the blessing, and the protection of God, then your life needs to be led by not your opinions, not by what is popular, but by God's principles. See, in a world that's focused on building followers, we need to be a church that is focused on building a firm foundation. That's what counts. What are you standing on? So here's what they said. They stood. Look at they stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. So there's a confession that you need to make. As you're in your rebuilding process here, and you're just trying to have a better marriage, a better life, and leave something better. In this process, there is a, there's a, a brokenness that needs to happen when you come face to face with the Word of God. And bring your life into alignment with His Word. And not just for your life. I love how he said they confess the sins of their ancestors. There are some things that's been passed down to you. See, you, can't, you cannot control the legacy you receive, but you can control the legacy you leave. And some of you have been given, passed down to you almost. You didn't ask for that dysfunction, that toxicity. You didn't, there's just divorce that's followed your name and your lineage and your history. There's addiction and drugs or alcohol. There's anger. There's, there's cheating. There's, there's anxiety. There's mental issues. There's, there's health issues. There are things that, that have followed you that if you're going to leave a godly legacy, you're not just going to confess your sins. You're going to break some generational things off of you in Jesus' name. Amen, somebody? Can we do that together right now? Every head bow, every eye close. Come on, you're in here today and you're building.
Keep building. Don't get discouraged. Keep building. Keep building. Keep going. Don't quit. You're going to reap a harvest if you don't give up. God, I pray over every person that's in here today. God, who feels like quitting, feels like giving up. Maybe they're in danger. Maybe there's defamation. There's all kinds of distraction pulling them from doing what you've called them to do. God, I pray right now for a recommitment and a realignment to your principles and your word, God. Help us to to not get distracted. Help us, God, to keep building in spite of the enemy's plans and attacks on my life and my legacy. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and maybe you have something stirring inside of you, maybe you've never really given your life to Jesus, but you know right now that, that you were made for more. Just hearing the message today, you've never even thought about life beyond your life, that everything that you've been investing your time to was for you, not for like leaving something. And God is showing you a bigger picture of life. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. You don't even know what real life is. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Some of you need to make that decision for the very first time today. Others of you need to make it again, and I'd love to help you. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but right where you are, here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to count to three, and I'd love for you to lift up your hand and lift it high if you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus today. Come on, it's why you're here. You know it. It's time. One, two, three. Lift up that hand. I surrender to Jesus. I need a fresh start right now. Come on, lift it high. Lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. All over this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, keep it up, keep it up. Come on, yeah, 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 yes. All back here, back there. Thank you, Jesus. All back there too. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, God, you're so good. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you pray something like this right there? Whisper it. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins, my past, my mistakes. I confess them today. I ask for your forgiveness. Jesus, I declare that you are my Lord and my Savior. I give you control. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Help me, God, to live for you. From this day forward, God, change me. Change me. Change my life. Change my mind. God, I speak that over every person. That you would help us, God, to continue building, continue working. That we would not give up. We would not quit. I speak to those who have started well but are coasting right now. And God, we're putting it back in gear. We're putting it back in gear. We're going to keep building, keep striving. We're going to finish strong and finish well. As long as there is breath in my lungs, I will do your work, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen, amen.